Um, so I'm going to turn the microphone over now to Pastor Chris Chantillo, who um, is um, Chris is an ordained clergyman of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. After an educational background in music at Gettysburg College, theology at Lutheran Theological Seminary at Gettysburg, and law at Fordham University School of Law, he served congregations in Pennsylvania and New York City before being called to Divinity Lutheran Church in Towson 12 years ago. He is currently pursuing postgraduate work on the totality of the Spirit in Luke at um, and he wrote this, I didn't write this. <laughs> However, the most significant learning he has experienced recently has been through his involvement with the Food and Faith Project, which has changed his young family's diet and palate, but also opened a new conversation in his dialogue about the faith. Um, and I should mention, Chris was with us at our very, very, very first meeting when we had the idea for the, the Food and Faith Project three years ago. It was you and Nina Beth Cardin and one other person, um, um, Alice Jellema from Church of the Guardian Angel. Um, we were a small little group and, and this is where we come from there. So he has been volunteering his time on our advisory committee since then, doing lots of, of great things and volunteering at church quite a bit as well. It's a beautiful space there. Um, which you'll see in a couple of weeks. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to him. He's going to talk a little bit about Adam and Eve, and so um, I just wanted to mention, in case you didn't catch the theme of the breakfast, um, it was fruit, Adam and Eve, and tempting stuff. So that's why you had chocolate cupcakes, or chocolate muffins today. Now we did bring some really healthy bread, and I wondered if anybody actually chose the healthy bread. Yeah. Oh! Oh, yeah. see, the goal is to tempt you away from the house. Well, truly, right. confession, I both <laughs> ate the cupcake and the bread, so I sit boldly. <laughs> a dialogical tension there. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Renz. It, it's really been fabulous to hear, and it's wonderful how your presentation and mine dovetail together so nicely without really having sat and talked about what we were going to do in depth. But I'm giving you uh, two readings of Adam and Eve, as Angela mentioned. Uh, and I chose these both, both of these readings because our origins for our cultures have their basis in eating events and around food. And that's how I would like us to look and talk about these. Uh, why do we have these two initiating events as eating events? The first is, of course, Adam and Eve. And in the Adam and Eve story, we have the movement from a holistic integration with creation to uh, an expansion and subsequent domination over creation, uh, and then a move toward desiring to survive, uh, because that becomes the main issue uh, after having eaten what is toxic to us in the garden. We need to then learn how to survive, and we have all these tools that we employ then to survive. Uh, and Adam and Eve, in, in their in the punishment uh, need to learn how to survive as well. Remember that uh, they begin to feel shame and have to employ their own industry to hide their God-given selves uh, from each other because they can't uh, be naked before each other and continue to survive. Uh, the God-given community from which the individual, uh, in which the individual is put uh, is blamed for the failures of the individual. So the community in which you're placed is now the scapegoat from which you cannot escape yourself, talking somewhat more about the uh, super organic and super individual side of what Dr. Mintz was talking about. Uh, even something as basic as childbirth, something necessary for survival, becomes in itself a danger to survival. Uh, and yet women are attracted to men and the, the uh, continuation of this toxic event for the community and yet supportive event for the community is uh, destined to continue. And then there's always this uh, tense and anxious relationship with the ground that is being mastered to produce food, such that the produce, in a, so that to produce in abundance or to be successful as a dominator of the earth is to be seen as a conquering hero or one who has righteously fulfilled a certain understanding of the God-given privilege of subduing the earth, which was commanded, of course, in the first creation story. So being able to survive and wrangle this land into your control becomes something heroic for uh, people to do. The second reading is from uh, Acts of the Apostles, a New Testament book, and it's the uh, famous account of 
Peter having his vision before he goes and visits Cornelius, a, a Roman centurion. And uh, I chose that one because it's, uh, it comes even before the circumcision debate, uh, as the debate for the division between the, the Christian church and the Jewish church. You know, we often think of Paul and circumcision as being the hot button item, but this is very early uh, where Peter has this vision uh, of the food, the picnic coming down from heaven. And so I wanted us to talk about what does that mean? Why this first and why this sort of, as Chris was pointing out, uh, a distinction between these cultures? Why the dividing line coming at this point? And what does that mean for us as we try and talk about working together in the good food movement? And what does it mean for us as we talk about the good food movement in general? So I provided the readings in the handout. If you'll sit in your groups, read them. There are discussion questions as well to help spur some conversation. Uh, they're on the last page, I think. And then we'll get together in plenary again in a few minutes and hear what you've talked about. Okay, if I can uh, corral us back together again, and we can share a little bit uh, in plenary about what's been happening in your individual tables. <laughs> Dr. Mintz and I had a very interesting discussion about uh, the, the readings that we were looking at, uh, and that uh, Dr. Mintz was theorizing that we begin with food issues because food security was a major concern for uh, all human community, and so it would be natural for us to use this as, as an originating uh, event for us. And then I asked him about, well, what does that mean for us now when, uh, as he was suggesting before, we don't have food insecurity, you know, we're much more sexual beings because we feast heartily every day, three or four times, six or seven times even. And uh, what implication does that have now for religion that's based on food insecurity or the need for food security? And we had a very interesting conversation about that. But I'm interested to hear what you all talked about at your table. So anybody volunteer, go ahead. Well, I've been intrigued by something. Um, You know, I think there's an inherent um, anxiety around eating, and that is we all know that it's an act of destruction or greed, or both. Um, you know, something has to be killed, or ripped from its vine, or something. And I think to mitigate that kind of anxiety, we compensate. We sanctify with blessings, or with grace, or... Um, in some way. Um, so I'm struck by that kind of uh, tension that eating is pleasurable, it's necessary, it's, um, it has all these benefits, um, but it causes some kind of existential angst as well. When Dr. Mintz was talking, you know, there was some mention of mediating between us and nature, and this is what I think religion does, right? It mediates, <coughs> um, it, it, it negotiates the world for us. Um, but that's clearly part of the story that we don't often talk about. We are, you know, destructive and greedily ingesting, and something has to be done with that, that angst. Anyone else? I'd like to add that part of the problem with, I don't know if it's a problem, it's just we have too many choices. Um, I can recall going to a restaurant with my two children and my husband, and you, know, you just sit around the table. Everybody's going to choose whatever they want to eat when you give them a choice. And that's what my family would do when we would eat out. Nobody ate the same food. We went to a buffet, you, you know, you've got so many options and so many choices, and you look over and see, oh, you got that? Yeah, I don't like that. I don't want that. You know, those are the choices that we have. So that's part of the drama of life. I feel. <coughs> so, I just want to add that. Mm -hmm. We uh, began with a question about whether um, environment and 
conditions have changed the individual, or has the individual now changed the environment? And reaching back to looking at Adam and Eve and how we're seeing almost a perpetuation of their original sin, that whereas in the beginning God created all that was good and it was e food was easily accessible, now as this act over food and how it has completely changed their environment where now they're in a position where they have to work hard for the food that they initially had easily and readily um, was able to receive. So we bounce some ideas around the table and thinking about how does that impact us now and looking at a very real situation in a neighborhood where food comes in that has both the good, fruits and vegetables, and the bad, if you will, pies and cakes and cookies to see what the community would choose. And we talked about how the lack of education in terms of even when you provide what is good, if there's no knowledge of how to prepare what is good, then you'll still have a tendency to choose what is bad, meaning the cakes, the pies, the cookies, and things like that. So then the discussion turns to go, what can we do? And a suggestion came up, can we organize a boycott of what, of possibly processed foods? Taking a model that's already existing, even though it's on a small scale, and seeing if we can take that model that's on a small scale, but still trying to return us back to Eden, if you will, in terms of us taking ownership and beginning to grow our own food and beginning to share with other communities the, the value of eating fresh fruits and vegetables and, and boycotting maybe processed food and organizing a group because we know at one time it was a very effective means of making a statement and it was the catalyst for change. And that's always been a theological question for me is the culpability of Adam and Eve pre-lapsarian. You know, they don't know the difference between good and evil, yet they're expected to differentiate between doing something good versus doing something which would be the act of eating. So it's only post-eating that they understand uh, that, hey, the, the serpent was wrong. You know, I will not be like a god. I will die from this. So education is an point. Well, this one, we sort of took off on that symbol because that issue there, I mean, if, if you equate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil with culture, then you have a bit of a problem, don't you, because God says don't eat of that, and sort of pits God against culture. Whereas, if the emphasis is on the word knowledge, to me, the biblical understanding of to know is really much more akin to where quantum physics is going. It's an interactive, creative. It's not abstract knowledge. Mm -hmm. The knower helps create what is known. And if that's the case, then, then the sin was human beings deciding to decide for themselves what's good and evil, rather than submit to the Creator's definition, that immediately leads to alienation, destructive alienation from self, from others, from the earth, why you get thrown out of the garden. Because the garden was that holistic unity with the, the, the Creator's definition of what's good and evil. So, and then culture, could we say that God's not against human culture? But maybe within every human culture is that instinctual drive to overcome that alienation, to get back to that sense of wholeness, that sense of, of what is good and evil. And, I mean, and traditional cultures seem to strive better than we do at that sense of being uh, overcoming the alienation yeah. with nature. So. Well, yeah, or, or even in a more primal sense, it seems to me God um, moves in a culture creative, creating a direction by, for no real reason, um, indicates that certain food is out of bounds. I mean, they're, they're, it's good, it's affirmed, but it's somehow a taboo. And in establishing that taboo, the, the basis of a culture is being um, generated. But the, um, what, what, what really puzzles me about the Acts um, text, though, is that it, um, it eliminates the category of taboo around what you can and can't eat. It, it erases boundaries. So on the one hand, it moves in the direction of being inclusive. But in another way, um, it's exclusive in that it says, if you now do not um, open yourself to all foods, you're outside the community. 
so on the one hand, it's um, redefining the cultural boundaries. But I think that, that, that my, my Christian um, inclination is to read this as a movement towards greater inclusivity. But in a, in a fundamental sense, the inclusivity is excluding um, a group that wants to abide by and live by um, the laws of Kashrut. So there is, there is a rivalry or tension. I mean, this is a community that's trying to figure out how in the world can we live together if we can't eat together. Mm -hmm. And the only way to create a, 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 an environment where you can eat together is to get rid of dietary regulations. But in getting rid of dietary regulations, it seems to me you're privileging one culture um, over another culture. Okay. Well, but, but Chris, what we always do is, I think, get hung up on Peter's vision and what it says about what you're just saying. Whereas to the members of the followers of the Way community, it's what it said about God. To the Orthodox Jew, Peter and these people were, were crazy, but to the Christians, it said something totally different about God because now here is God affirming that we can do something that God had said for centuries we couldn't do according to the Torah. And it, it raises a really very basic understanding or question about our understanding of God and does God change God's mind? Now, let me, let me try to get a synthesis. I was very interested in your comments about how humans don't know what to eat, but they have language. Animals know what to eat, but they don't have language. So is it not conceivable, and I'm coming now to anthropology, I hope, that what is going on here is that language and the culture that derives from it gives us the ability to divorce ourselves more and more from nature or the garden, if you want to call it that, and disrupt it. So what do we do? We turn food into garbage and into sewage, whereas the animal returns to nature its input, throughput, output. But we, with our creativity, quote unquote, turn it into garbage and sewage. So we we really can work ourselves far from God and from the creation story. Yeah, come on, first, I see that so-called Council of Jerusalem decision a little differently in the sense that it didn't say that, that the Jewish Christians should not go on observing the, the, the dietary rules. What it said was that they could not impose those rules as a condition. You didn't have to be Jewish to be Christian. You, didn't, you could not impose that in order on, on the Gentiles. But also what we forget is they did, they did impose a dietary restriction in one sense on the Gentiles. It said restrain, re, refrain from eating food uh, uh, blood, blood sacri with, with blood uh, you know, that, that was to create, I think, an attempt to create an environment where the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians could sit down at the same table together. So it wasn't, a, I think it was a very pastoral decision to try to balance you know, the requirements of both and not to exclude either. And, and in that sense, I think it was more inclusive. That it was, I think it's a misreading to say it's a rejection of the, the right of those who wanted to live by the kosher rules to, to do that. Well, yeah. but, well I, yeah, well and, and, and I mean, look, if you're eating out all the dishes and you're, well, again, I, I get to, this is a very technical, becomes a very technical um, argument. But it, it, it strikes me that there is a rivalry, if you will, built into the very foundational story. Whether the rivalry gets um, resolved in a way that's really inclusive, or if the, the seeds of, of division are, are there at the outset, um, is an intriguing question that I think would take a while to unpack. Well, the backdrop is the conflict between the synagogue and the church. It's going on in the late 60s, early 70s. By this time, by which by which point the conflict is pretty much settled. I mean, they're not going to be able to live together. And, and I think also it goes to speak a little bit to what Dr. Mintz said earlier. You know, is it is it it's okay 
or you know, he read something or said something about sauerkraut and collard greens, and it, you know, is, you know, is this God's way of using food to say it's okay to be separate cultures and still exist together without imposing your your beliefs, whether they be dietary or any other, on that culture, so that that becomes the division in which you can't exist together. So, you know, he says, you know, uh, Paul says in another scripture that, you know, everything sanctified by a word of prayer is okay. So, um, but in, 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 in that context, you know, who, who is he talking to? I don't think he's trying to uh, persuade the Jew to, uh, not, you know, not conform to, the, to the, their rules of old as well as the Gentiles not to uh, impact their culture by what they believe. So I think it was just a, 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 um, a way of saying you can still be uh, individual, you can still have your individual beliefs as different cultures and still come together. Thank you all for your fine discussion. It sounds like it really spurred some interesting conversation at your tables. It also seems like you've reached uh, sort of where I was driving at when I read Dr. Mintz's quote from uh, Sweetness and Power, his book about sugar. It's on the front of the sheet here. And uh, I'd just like to highlight it in our closing. What constitutes good food, like what constitutes good weather, a good spouse, or a fulfilling life, is a social, not a biological matter. Good food, as Levi Strauss suggested long ago, must be good to think about before it becomes good to eat. <laughs> and with that, we'll close and see you next time.